Hello, welcome to the conversation here on News Central Television. This is the program where we bring you up to date with all the political happenings on the continent. I am Genga Aboroa. And I am Rita Omodia. Today on the program, we will be looking at the political situation in Nigeria with less than a year to the 2023 general elections. President Muhammad Buhari is yet to sign the Electoral Act Amendment Bill. We'll also be looking to Liberia, where we understand that President Buhari has pardoned an ex-minister over corruption. And uh, it's caused a lot of rancor in the social media space. I mean, we were expecting President Muhammad Buhari of Nigeria mm -hmm. to uh, ascend Sign to the today. bill. Yes, that was yesterday. And a lot of uh, civil society organizations actually said they would protest if uh, President Muhammad Buhari fails to ascend the bill. So what the latest development we're hearing now is it's going to happen on Friday. So maybe we should exercise some patience. Well, let's see if Nigerians mm. actually have that patience. As said earlier on, it was expected that Nigeria's President Muhammad Buhari would sign the Electoral Act Amendment Bill yesterday, Tuesday, February 22nd, 2022, after lawmakers in the Senate and House of Representative Chambers of the National Assembly passed the harmonized version of the bill in January. Signing the bill would have synchronized with the timetable already released by the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, stating that the elections would begin February 18, 2023. But latest reports today from a source close to the presidency who had earlier indicated that the president would assent to the bill today, Wednesday, has also confirmed that President Muhammad Buhari will now uh, sign the revoked Electoral Act Amendment Bill on Friday, February the 25th. The president withheld his assent to the bill in November 2021, citing the cost of conducting direct primary elections, security challenges, and possible manipulation of electoral processes by political players as part of the reasons for his decision. Now, joining us on the conversation, this are to discuss uh, these uh, Ini Behe Afyong, a human rights lawyer, and uh, we have in the studio with us uh, Kunle Lawal, Executive Director, Electoral College, Nigeria. Got join us from Lagos, Nigeria. Gentlemen, a warm welcome to you both. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, I'd like to start with Kunle. Amidst the outcry from critics who raised concerns about the delayed signing of the Electoral Bill, the Presidential uh, spokesperson Femi Adesino said President Buhari's delay in signing the law was within the requirements of the law. Uh, he further stated that it would only be appropriate to say President Buhari acted against the law if he exceeds the 30-day window provided by the Constitution to take a decision on the bill. Is the President still acting within the ambit and according to the law? Of course, here I'd like to point out that um, stating from when the National Assembly has sent the bill to the president, to the president's office, uh, for him to sign, there's a 30-day window as allowed by the Constitution, which is constitutional. But um, we, uh, I think most people were expecting the president to sign earlier, as regards uh, the, the signing of the bill could help affect, it could affect directly the date of the 2023 elections. So um, it's right to say, yes, the president is within his constitutional provision for such. Okay, talking about the elections, while we await the president's arsons, I don't know, do we have Inibeha Fiong with us? Uh, so while we await the president's arsons, all the analysts say the president's refusal to sign the electoral bill constitutes an obstruction to the democratic principle of credible elections. Is that really the case? Do we have uh, the president obstructing democratic principles of credible elections? The, the, the truth of the matter is that President Buhari and the APC-led government does not take electoral reform seriously. The same way the government has not taken any other aspect of our national life seriously. The same way insecurity is not taken seriously. The same way the economy is not taken seriously. The same way the restructuring the promise is not taken seriously. There has been this, you know, general failure to take responsibility, general failure to lead. That explains the apathy on the part of the president. And to look at it clearly, you can also see that the man does not care about what becomes of the electoral process. The excuses that he has given consistently are baseless as far as I'm concerned, because these are matters that if the president were to act in good faith, 
the president had legitimate concerns about some of the clauses in the proposed bill, in the bill. This is a matter that they could have just, you know, discussed with the leadership of the two houses of the National Assembly, led and controlled by members of his own political party. Why is it that when it comes to approval of abominable loans, we do not see a disagreement between Buhari and the National Assembly? Why is it that when it comes to approval of nominees, of questionable nominees, we do not see this kind of divergence between the executive and the legislature? How come that it is only when the interest of the country is affected in such a serious matter in fundamental issues like electoral reform? That is why we see this pretentious disagreement between the president and the National Assembly. The point I am making is that all the excuses, the flimsy excuses that the president has given for withholding in that sense, I think the fourth time, are uh, excuses that shouldn't have arisen in the first place, that shouldn't have been given if truly there was a genuine desire to reform my electoral system. Now, you have an addition of saying the president has 30 days. Yes, section 58 of the constitution gives the 38 week, the, the 30 days window. But why do you need to wait for the 30th day? That was what happened the last time he withheld his assets. It shows the government is incompetent. It shows there are no serious people in this government. Because you have a Ministry of Justice. And in the Ministry of Justice, they even have a department that examines bills passed by the National Assembly. You have an Attorney General of the Federation. You have a legal advisor in the State House. The President has ample resources. He has the human resources that should vet these bills and tell him within 24 hours whether his concerns have been addressed or not. He does not have to wait for 30 days, especially given the urgency of now, given that there are by-elections, that the are, are elections that, are to be, that is to be conducted in Ocean State, you know, and even supplementary elections in cross river states, that the serious government would have, you know, acted in the national interest expeditiously. But you have these people sitting down there saying that Buhari has 30 days to determine whether to sign the bill or not. So this, again, as I said, reinforces the position of some of us that okay. nobody in the real sense is leading this country. There is no other way to look at it. Thank you, Ibehen. Um, Kunle, the Independent National Electoral Commission uh, Commissioner and Chairman of Voter Education Committee, Festos Okoye, in an interview revealed that it may be forced to postpone the 2023 general elections if President Muhammad Buhari fails to assent the revoked Electoral Act Amendment Bill by Tuesday. According to him, there are some fundamental timelines in the new electoral bill that will fundamentally affect the electoral legal framework. Tuesday is far past. What are we to expect? So um, <coughs> you have this um, whole set of things and set of principles that would totally affect the, the 2023 election. And here is why it will affect it. A few things like first, the prices of um, expression of interest or nomination forms by political parties. Um, if the electoral bill comes into play, then it will mean that for presidency, nobody can charge for a form more than 10 million. I think for governorship, 5 million, and then subsequently for senator, 2 million, and I'm already conversant with lower points for now. So um, it will affect the way political parties even have the options of. So it will mean consensus candidates, which was put in by the Senate, and then uh, direct primaries and indirect primaries will be a choice open to political parties on choosing how they pick their, pick their candidates. Now, the INEC has already released an earlier, com a, an earlier timetable which states that um, all federal elections, that's presidential, Senate, and House of Rep, should, be de should conclude their primaries by the end of July 2022. And then uh, governor, executive, uh, governor, of course, and State House of Assembly must complete their primaries by um, August 2022. But um, if there's an alteration in all this, it will alter the amount of costs, to alter mode of primaries, it will alter quite a whole lot of things. And then let's also remember that with this new electoral bill comes in the electronic transmission of results, which will now become legal. So INEC has to prepare for that. So I see it pushing back if the president doesn't assent immediately, pushing back. But at this point, I'd like to note something critical. A lot of people, a lot of people around the space, around the democratic space, around different sectors have always questioned the president on the reason of sign, um, on, on his not signing the electoral bill. The question I'd like to ask is, do we forget that this, the National Assembly can veto the president? 
So the National Assembly is just as culpable as the president. And this is not taking sides. This is just us opening up how our democracy works and trying but, to, so, trying so to find to out exactly you, Kule, Can the National Assembly do that yes. before the expiration of the yeah, 13 the, days the, the, or the National after? Assembly has the right to veto the president at any time. They could have vetoed the president in November if they wanted it to do, if they wanted it done. So the truth is, let's, let's really look at the real picture. Who exactly is culpable right now? We've spent so much time mentioning the president, the president, the president. If a few of us just took a little time to open our constitution, we found out that the National Assembly could have vetoed the president at any point without waiting for his, his signature on the bill. Okay, I think the reason why a lot of people are putting more fingers on the president and not making judgments is because to a lot of people, to Nigerians, he's the major executive officer. But aside that, now we're hearing reports that probably on Friday, uh, the president will assent to this bill. Is there any difference between Tuesday and Friday? Are the consequences today still remain the same or probably it's also within the same time frame? Well, I am looking at it as a bigger difference between... Uh, November, which this bill could have, which the Senate, the National Assembly could have vetoed the president and now. That's the time frame I'm looking at. And if, if the president decides not to sign it on Friday, the National Assembly might be forced to take a veto against the president. And if they do, then the question will now be, why didn't they take this veto, which is well within their constitutional provisions a long time ago. Okay, Kule, I will stick to you. While you talked about uh, uh, pointing fingers at other stakeholders, we have the president, we have the National Assembly. There are also other comments opposing the fact that a new law must be signed at 12 to 18 months to allow INEC conduct elections in 2023. According to sources, to other sources, whether there is a new electoral act or not, INEC has the responsibility to ensure free, fair and transparent elections come 2023. What are your thoughts to this? Well, INEC is directly under the purview of the National Assembly. Let's be very honest about this. INEC's, INEC's direction. So INEC will await the, the electoral bill. If, it's, if it is going to be adjusted and Nigerians say um, they, be, they want to use the new electoral bill in 2023, then it means that elections might not hold in, in February. It might hold in March. And, you know, that would probably coincide with the two weeks that was taken from last uh, 2019 elections and probably hold about mid-March. Um, the truth about it is that as long as um, INEC, INEC has the power, to, of course, to, to execute the elections, but the mandate and control of INEC and its functionaries, of course, lie under the, the National Assembly and not the president. Thank you, Kunle. Uh, in Ibehe, does the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria, okay, uh, staying with you, uh, Kunle, uh, does the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria grant uh, the Independent National Electoral Commission the power to issue subsidiary legislation that is known as rule making powers? And how would you uh, assess the administration of INEC as an electoral regulatory body in Nigeria? Well, the Constitution is clear on who has, who has the rule-making powers, and that is, of course, the, legislat the legislative arm, or, or the legislative arm of, of government, and that, that power, those powers will lie with the National Assembly and State Houses of Assembly to take such decisions on laws. It uh, does not lie with any executive function. The INEC itself is, is of course, a, a, is a, a department or an agency, sorry, an agency on that under the, the National Assembly, and its purview as supervisory act is by the National Assembly. Uh, looking at the actions of INEC, of course, with the new CVR reg uh, registration, continuous voter registration, which we are seeing, which has been automated to a point apart from biometrics, you must at least give INEC a commendation from what exactly it was preceding 2019 to what it's doing right now. Um, I remember there was a test of electronic transmission, I think, in the Edo ele elections in um, 2020. And I think within that time, INEC has, of course, we will not say we are the perfect state. Of course, we have a lot of things to do. But I think functioning within laws which are applicable right now with our constitution, I think INEC has done, I would give them a 60% uh, job done with the work they're doing. Okay, why would you, why you gave uh, INEC a 60%? Uh, Nigerians will also have their own verdict on uh, the level of percentage because uh, feelings from around are still complaining about the level of conductions in Nigeria. But over to you, F. Young. Earlier on, uh, Benga asked the question of whether the Constitution actually grants INEC the power to use, to issue subsidiary legislation, what we call rule-making powers. And in your position, how would you assess INEC? Do you feel the executive has overruled its position? 
take hard power to issue subsidiary legislation yes. or guidelines. That is not the issue. The power is there. If you look at the literal act, INEC has power to make subsidiary legislation. It is also recognized. But the Supreme Court has put it to rest in several cases, including the case of Udo Emmanuel and Manoko Mana, uh, Yesom Wike and Akuku Peter side, and of course the awesome uh, the Benue governor's gate, and a couple of other cases where the issue of the legal and constitutional status of the use of the smart card reader for accreditation was determined. And what the Supreme Court said is that until these things are ingrained, these things are enacted in the act itself, the principal legislation, they cannot be the basis for qualifying an election. So what that means is that in as much as subsidiary legislations issued by INEC or simply say regulation made by INEC, which one the electoral acts are cognizable and valid, to the extent that the non-compliance or issue as the non-compliance arises, one cannot predicate a petition at the tribunal or a, a lawsuit in court, either pre-election matter or post-election, to say that because there was non-compliance with social and social guidelines, therefore, this election should be set aside. That is only possible where that non-compliance is one that is within the purview of the electoral act, the principal legislation. That is why it is important for the act itself to be passed. Because if you look at the guidelines, the guidelines, for example, makes it necessary, in fact, almost compulsory, for accreditation to be done electronically through smart card reader. But the electoral act, 2010 has amended the Eastern electoral act, still has recourse to manual voting. So which one takes precedence? And the Supreme Court says, well, it has to be the smart card reader. That is why it is important for this issue to be reflected in the electoral act, not just to say let INA rely on their regulation. Now, one other point, the, the other commentator said that the National Assembly is also at fault because they can override the veto of the president, if, if I heard him correctly. That is true. Section 58 of the Constitution gives the National Assembly the power to override the assent of the president. But guess what? Since 1999, I can say it authoritatively, there had never been a successful override of presidential veto. It has never happened. The closest attempt to that happened when the then President Obama and George declined assent to the amendment to the 2001 Electoral Act. And the matter went to court. And the court of appeal held in the case of National Assembly and the President of the Federal Republic, that the procedure for overriding assent Require that when the president has either refused his assent within the 30 days timeline or is deemed to have withheld assent if he does not sign after 30 days, is that the process of passage must go full sway. Because what they did in 2001 was that they simply sat and passed the resolution and said, We have override the veto. No, you must go through first reading, you must go through second reading, proceed to committee stage go to report stage, go through third reading when the bill is finally passed. And you must also do that by two-third majority. Now you have a National Assembly that has become basically a presidential lapdog, if you can allow me to use that expression. A National Assembly that has become an appendage of the executive. National Assembly whose, whose leadership has publicly gone on record to pledge their loyalty to the president. These are people without the character. These are people without the, the integrity to say they want to override the veto of the president under the current climate, they cannot do it, which my, I agree is also a failure of leadership on their part. But I just need to say on record that while in theory this is possible, this has never happened in practice since 1999. The, okay. the time that an attempt was made for that to be done, it had failed. Thank you very much, Inibeha. I would like to stay with you. A lot of uh, Nigerians would like to know uh, why is there so much... Uh, attention to this electoral bill. How does it depart from the past electoral bill and what are the benefits to Nigeria's electoral uh, process and strengthening of our democracy? I have my own concerns with even the, the, the president's bill before the president. There is an obnoxious clause, for example, that seeks to expunge a provision in the existing electoral act of 2010 as amended by saying that only participants, only aspirants, can go to court to challenge the information given to INEC by candidates. That is a bit problematic for me, because under the current electoral act, any person, any Civil voter, society, anyone. can go to court. But the current bill says only players in the field. 
And you and I, all of us know how corrupt the political process is. So what that means is that we will no longer have voters have the right to go to court to challenge the information supplied to INEC by those seeking to represent them. I also have a problem with this issue of consensus candidature, which they have now made one of the alternative forms of conducting primary. Because you now have a situation where you have direct primary, which from as experimented in Lagos and recently in Oshu, is being characterized by allegations of fraud and manipulation. You also have the indirect primary. Now you have what they have introduced called the consensus candidature, which for me is just an intrusement of dictatorship in political parties. It means that the leaders of the party, for example, Buari can just sit down with the governors and say, we want Mr. So so and so to be our candidate in 2023. So I am not very comfortable with allowing consensus arrangement under a climate where there is no internal democracy, where nobody can checkmate anybody. Look at APC, for example, they have not been able to hold their convention. The same thing is the PDP. So when you have these two parties that are being taxed, so-called big parties, unable to organize themselves, unable to allow internal democracy, and you are now strengthening their, their, their regime of impunity by saying they should bring candidates through consensus, what you are doing is that you are derailing the democratic process. So if I were to be in a position to take a decision, I do not think I would have allowed that to prevail. But by and large, let us not throw away the baby with the bad water. Whatever grievances we have, since it is obvious that this is not a parliament that is acting in the interest of the people or a president that truly really cares about the process of reforming the electoral system, let the bill just be passed so that the good part of it, you know, can possibly be experimented and we see what future National Assembly can do regarding the contentious area that some of us are concerned about. Okay, while we're looking at the integrity of the uh, electoral amendments bill, I will still stay with you, Ethan, just on this question. We have one of the futures there, which is the electronic transmission of election results, and you yourself mentioned it. Uh, so explain what the benefits of this are, and aside from it being in the law, do you think it is feasible with the technological system we have in Nigeria? It is the way to go. I'm being honest with you. I have had the opportunity of being involved in election petitions, in, and also in pre-election matter. And my experience is that, except we digitalize the process of conducting elections in Nigeria, we are just wasting our time. See the level of reform, positive reform that the Carida alone as the mode of accreditation has brought to the electoral process, has brought to be an electoral process. You can imagine what will happen if we have a distant leadership at the parliament and the executive with the political will to enshrine electronic accreditation, electronic voting, and le an electronic transmission of results, or what you would call an electronic collation of results. What that means is that when voting is done at the polling unit, you have the results being transmitted to the wards. And of course, from the world collation center, you go to the local government collation center, you go to the state collation center, and so on and so forth. It means that that process will now be done digitally. That is the, the, the presiding officers will just stay at the comfort of the pooling unit and transmit the results. And what that does is that INEC is supposed to have a server, INEC is supposed to have a, a platform where those results are electronically up uploaded. So that as the process is going on, a candidate and a political party can conveniently stay at their situational room and be monitoring their performance live. This will aid transparency in the process. This will give the confidence you know, improve the confidence of the voters in the process. But what you have now is that you have a situation where results are declared at the pooling units. You can have some criminals, some talks, stay on the way, hijack materials before you know, so you hear that results have been substituted. Mm. These things happen. These things happen in court. These things happen in tribunals. We see evidence of this. So for you to forestall that, the best way, the solution is to allow, in fact, make it the only way of transmitting results. As long as you still have this manual way, primitive way of conducting election, then we are not going to make any progress. So I am Thank entirely you. in favor of the use of electronics and technology mm -hmm. in the conduct of elections. Thank you very much. Now, Kunde, elections in Nigeria have uh, generally, uh, I mean, next year makes it 24 years of our uninterrupted uh, democratic experience since 1999. Elections in Nigeria have always been characterized by vote buy-in, um, book buying, uh, election, snatch -snatch violence. Ballots, election violence, and, and water view. Looking at the journey, Nigeria's democratic journey since 1999 to uh, today, would you 
uh, how would you rate INEC as a, uh, an independent electoral umpire? Would you say we've moved the needle a lot towards enshrining a democracy as part of our system? So, so we have to look at this holistically. There's something that always happens when we're talking about INEC, elections, and everything generally. We tend to point fingers at INEC, but it's a holistic system. Now, the bill has laws. I'll give you an example. So even within the present Electoral Act, nobody is supposed to spend, that's running for president, supposed to spend more than one billion naira. Somebody running for Senate is not supposed to spend up to 40 million naira. That is the case, but somewhere within the bill, it says INEC should monitor these things. These are the laid down rules that are clear. But guess what? There is nobody directly mandated to handle this. So INEC is actually overwhelmed with quite a lot of stuff that it cannot directly provide. And then the people itself do not also hold people, uh, hold these candidates or aspirants that emerge accountable. And I, I, I speak not only from the advantage in my experience brings is that I, I've been a candidate. I've, I've been on the National Executive Council of a political party. So I've seen it from all angles, and now I'm a citizen. So I'm seeing it from all angles and when I'm describing it. So we, too, influence vote buying. Everybody wants their vote to be bought. And, you know, as much as we scream we want to be a good country, I'll be honest and say the electoral bill is not something that is going to stand up and hit us on our head. So I think it's part of even the average Nigerian's duty to understand what the electoral bill is and what is exactly, what is exactly permissible by the bill and then start to hold ourselves according to it, hold it accountable. Like most, I've heard most people say direct primaries is expensive. I'll tell you the truth. The average, the average uh, not the big two, but the smaller, the, I wouldn't call them smaller parties. I'll say the fringe parties. The fringe parties always emerge, and I have emerged from a direct primaries. And what direct primaries is, is just align every member have a say, not just all members. Now, it won't be all the members in Nigeria, but if you have, let's say, a, a senator that is emanating from Lagos East. It means all the people in uh, the party in Lagos East will be allowed to vote. And people will ask, oh, it's more financially expensive. But I'll tell you that in an election, just from expression of interest and, and um, nomination forms for political parties, parties earn as much as 5 billion naira per state. And those are the two big parties. And these are the truths we are not looking at. What is done with that 5 billion naira? What exactly goes on? Is it a pay package for people that have won national positions in the political parties? These are the questions we're not asking ourselves. A political party, according to the Constitution, should even put down its assets and liabilities clearly with preceding an election. We've not seen this done at any time, but this is already law in Nigeria. It's, it's law in Nigeria. So as long as we do not know the law, as much as we demand good governance and do not know the law, there is no how we can engage with the system because we don't understand it. Okay, while you say that uh, INEC is overwhelmed, uh, I don't know, as a regulator, is it overwhelmed or lack of view power coming from the part of INEC? Kule? I, I'd like to say INEC has a lot of things to do. INEC has a lot of things to do. INEC does not requisitely have the manpower to do what it, it needs to do. So um, do they need more personnel? I, I, I wouldn't say more personnel necessarily. I think what INEC might need to do is break down itself into components and then have those that are strictly uh, with electoral issues, that's um, electoral council issues, uh, separate, uh, separate council, and then those that are mandated to monitor financially how much is being spent on campaigns and how much is being spent by political parties. That should be another arm. It can all be in the same INEC because we don't need to be creating multiple MDAs. Nigeria already has over 1,500. We don't need so much. So this could be departments, but structured to function within a particular parameter. You don't just have everybody in INEC going all over the place and nothing gets done like a circus. Okay. I still stay with you, Kunle. The House of Representatives on Thursday called on INEC to urgently deploy physical enumerators and other assistance to conduct new voter registration across all federal constituencies. What are your thoughts to this? Well, um, I think INEC will have to, to be, for this to be very effective and to cover Nigeria entirely, um, I think INEC will have to pull in um, ad hoc staff. That's what eventually, and I hope the National Assembly too is thinking of the budget of that, because uh, without an increase in budget for that, I don't think INEC will be able to add up to that. But I need to point this out here. 
as much as we drive this continuous voter registration, I don't think Nigeria has really had a voter registration problem. Nigeria has, um, as of 2019, we had 84 million uh, people with PVCs, yet only 28 million participated in elections. And since 2015, we've noticed a drop. 2015, we had a 50% uh, uh, participation of people with PVCs. So I think we need to even start to engage people on what exactly the system runs on for them to participate effectively, because most people just use the, the PVC as, an, as a means of identification and nothing else. Meanwhile, the PVC has two uses, to be able to recall the legislative and to be able to vote. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. This is where uh, we wrap things up on this uh, topic. It's been an absolute pleasure having you share your insights with us on the Nigeria's uh, 2022 Electoral Amendment Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching The Conversation on New Central Television. When we come back, President George Ware of Liberia has just granted executive clemency uh, to a senator, a senator-elect accused of corruption. Uh, we'll be discussing this and the implications when we return. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the conversation. Liberia's president, George Weir, has pardoned ex-defense minister Brownie Sumakai, who was sentenced to a prison term by the Supreme Court for corruption. Uh, Sumakai and two others who walked under him were convicted of failing to account for more than a million dollars deducted routinely from soldiers' salaries for savings while he was Minister of Defense under former President Erlen Johnson Sirleaf. Now, throughout his trial, Samukai maintained the money had been spent on other official matters and on the others of the former president. Interestingly, a senior minister in Mr. Ware's office told a press conference that the government will pay the money Samukai owes the former soldiers and he will then pay back the government. The court had ruled that he should remain in jail until he paid back the money, but he never entered jail and the pattern means that he may be able to take his seat as a senator and works towards repaying the government. And now joining us live to discuss this is uh, Joel Cholo Brooks. He is the CEO of Global News Network, Monrovia, Liberia, and Hansen Goncia Ableon, Criminal Justice University of Monserrado County, Liberia. Gentlemen, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for accepting us to appear on the program. All right, so let's start now. When a former football star, Judge Ware, won Liberia's presidential election in 2017, he promised to make transforming the lives of all Liberians the singular mission of his presidency. It's been four years since President Ware has been in office. How successful has he been in transforming the lives of Liberians? Well, uh, as you're aware, <laughs> footballer turned president, uh, Liberians are hopeful of uh, Mr. George Ware doing better. Uh, he has been in office, like you said, four years now, but uh, people are still uh, pessimistic of uh, Mr. Weir uh, meeting his promises as he planned to carry out the government. And the latest is the issue with the Bernie Semoka, like you mentioned earlier. Uh, people have been looking up to him. Uh, just yesterday, his minister broke the ice that uh, they would pay the money, but he has not been free totally. He has been suspended. He has being suspended from the case until until further notice. But the, pres the president ordered the Minister of Finance to make payment of the over $2 million to, uh, to free Mr. Mr. Uh, 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 Mr. Uh, uh, um, Samaka Samaka. out of the whole show. Now, Joe, President George Ware has issued the convicted senator-elect of Lofer County, Brownie Samakai, a uh, reprieve clemency, but the reprieve clemency uh, issued did not suspend the jail order uh, from the Supreme Court. It provides uh, Simaka extra time to restitute the uh, $1 million laundered. Is this a legal decision? And what do you think informed the president's thinking to go ahead and uh, issue him with this clemency reprieve? I think what is what the president did is to to certify the home people of uh, Mr. Samaka. You know, Mr. Samaka is from Lofa County. Yes. And over the past uh, year, people of Lofa County have been so aggrieved of the issue concerning Samaka is not being seated at the Senate since he was elected. And then another thing, they have been calling on the president. So 
people are saying his decision is belittled, even though uh, many people today who we talk to uh, express satisfaction, especially those from Lofa County, express satisfaction of the president's decision. But he has not been taken off the hook. The issue has been suspended, like I said, he has not been taken off the hook. So the thing here is that people are looking forward to seeing whether uh, Mr. Samaka will be able to meet up with whatsoever. He's not going anymore to the Senate, of course. That does not give him the way to go to the Senate. But the president is saying uh, he paying this amount as a means of uh, bringing, him up, bringing him to his people to go to his people. Because right now, Samaka cannot, we cannot find Samaka where he is now. Send away now that he should have been arrested to send him for, for two years. Okay, uh, we also have uh, Blayon with us uh, to discuss this issue. So, uh, continuing from where we had Joel stop, and he talked about uh, President George Wears issuing the convicted senator elect of Lofa County, Brandon Samikai, reprieve clemency, and said that one of the reasons because to put him in a good position in the Lofa County. Now, Blayon, do you believe this submission? Blayon? Okay, so okay. there's still uh, a lot of So the, there are different ways to look at this issue. There's some that argue that, you know, President Ware did it out of, because Liberia just celebrated uh, 200 years of nationhood, the uh, yeah. bicentennial, that he did it out of the spirit of reconciliation. And others say, you know, it's not that altruistic of a decision from uh, Mr. Ware, that he did it because of political uh, uh, exigencies, because I mean. he wants to win uh, the votes in Lofa County. But let's uh, ask um, Mr. Brooks uh, what his thoughts are. Uh, Mr. Brooks, are you there? I'm here, I'm here. Okay, okay. great. Some analysts have said President Ware's decision is political and uh, would put him in a good position to improve his vote intake in Lofa County, the stronghold of his uh, political outrival uh, former Vice President Joseph Bokai in the 2023 elections. Others have also said, you know, it's in the reconciliatory spirit of Liberia's uh, bicentennial celebrations. What is the true, uh, what, what do you think is behind uh, President Weir's decision? I think, I think the President's decision is politically motivated because, uh, you know, just we have few, few moments for elections. Election is next year, and Lofa County is one of the biggest county that has a lot of votes. And then uh, people there are looking forward to seeing whether their citizen will be out, out of whatever is happening. So right now, the, pre the president's decision, I, I must say, even everybody is saying, as a journalist, they are saying that uh, his decision was politically motivated. You know, we just celebrated the 200, 200 years yeah. uh, celebration, but still, the president's decision today, I think, is towards gaining favor from the people of Lofa County. Okay, aside from it being political, some critics also slam it as a witch hunt due to Semikai's alleged refusal to join the ruling coalition for democratic change during the 2020 elections. What do you make of this? <laughs> of course, I'm one of those who asked Mr. Semika as to whether he was asked to join the, 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 the ruling party. And during one of the interviews with him, he admitted, yes, indeed, uh, some of his colleagues within the CDC, which is the coalition party, asked him to join, but he said he cannot leave his, his uncle. And normally people in Lofa, if you are from Lofa, uh, you're an older person, you are considered as uncle. So he said, I cannot abandon my uncle to join any political party. So I, I agree with you. Uh, people, many people are looking at that as a wish hunt. Hmm. Now, um, what's the reaction of ordinary Liberians to the president uh, granting executive clemency in the form of reprieve to Lofa County uh, Senator Bounty Semakai? And how does this affect his uh, anti corruption war? <laughs> now, yeah, if you, if you were to, to walk down the streets of Morovia, the capital of Liberia, you listen to people lauding the president's decision. All are saying, well, it just it, it just it just a means to gain favor from the people of Lofa County, uh, because uh, people are saying from the initial start, they say, yes, okay, the president's 
is standing his ground because uh, he don't want corruption to over, overwhelm his government. But then again, with the issue right now, people are saying the president is trying to baffle corruption and gain favor from the people of Lofa County because Brandy Sabuka was convicted of misapplying millions of dollars intended for soldiers, ex-soldiers. So, I mean, that's it. People are also blaming the ex-president, uh, Ellen Johnson Salif, because Brandy at one point said that he will authorize that Madame yeah. Salif to, to use the amount in question. But then the question here is that could refuse to allow Madame Salif to appear to testify or to either agree or deny as to whether it is true that she gave she gave order to the former defense minister to go ahead. Has so she issued any statements right in private, in, in a personal capacity, uh, or has she just kept quiet about this issue? Yeah, I mean... Uh, and on what mean, grounds did the courts refuse her to appear as a witness? Yeah, but the thing here is that it was not... They, 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 they could say that they cannot invite Madame Saleh because... Brandy did not really have a documentation that could, could indict the ex president. Mm. So she could not be invited to answer the question as it relating to the money in question. Okay, well, this puts a question mark, just like you rightly said, to where's fight in anti corruption? I mean, the former head of Liberia's anti corruption commission, James Berger, has also accused the government of uh, President Ware of not doing enough to fight corruption. But now, with this decision, what is going to happen? To the senator elects Brandis and Mackay's seat, do we see him going back to his position? What's the future like? Well, I mean, these are these are the questions I, I posed to many of the so many of the officials here. I asked them, in fact, I talked to the Minister of Justice this afternoon as to whether with the latest development, uh, if uh, Brandis and Mackay will be seated as senator of the people of Nova County. He said the president did not say that the president only suspended a jail term to pay the money, and he has to pay the money back. So it's not free. I mean, he has not he has not gone off the hook. So I mean, he cannot take the seat as you as you earlier uh, mentioned. He cannot take the seat as senator of, of Lofa County. Now I'd like to bring in Hansen. Hansen, uh, the former head of Liberia's Anti-Corruption uh, Commission, James Verdier, accused the government of President Ware of undermining his fight against corruption. There's some uh, on the streets of Monrovia and in Liberia that believe that uh, with this decision, it means that uh, big politicians can't not go to jail. Because, uh, I mean, there are people that have stolen uh, in oh, Liberia man. and they don't uh, get to pay back. They don't, they don't get to say, look, I don't want to go to jail. Let me go work for the money and then uh, return it to state coffers. What's, what are your thoughts on all of this? Uh, saga. Well, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So I'm Hamsen for Hamsen G. Blyan, and I'm a student of the African Veterinary Peace oh, University, a freshman student in the Criminal Justice. So as it relates to your questions, and I listened to my colleague, uh, the president made an executive clause out of 1986 Constitution, Article 59. But the issue of corrections remain a problem in, the, in this in the government. In the, President, we are reaching because corruption is still a, a, a issues that he's still fighting. So, with releasing of a partner with our a former or defense minister Brian Samuka is still a problem in the country because, like we are aware, like he said, we next year we'll be going to we'll be going to elections, and I think it's a way of getting the people of Lofa County vote, and it also a way of our, of seeing how he can identify with the people, but with the law. I think he should bear with the sentence. And the, so, but the question remains is what happened if he still becomes senator? Because, like we speak, uh, the legislature had declared that the seat is vacant. And now they, they order the National Election Commission to conduct by elections in Lofa County. So the question is will he still become a senator? So the issue of corruption is still a problem that the president is still fighting to regain his crime and see how he can tackle corruption in Liberia. Has he made any other efforts to address the issue of corruption in Liberia? I mean, from records, we see that Liberia is uh, uh, 136 in the fight against corruption. Apart from this issue, do you see any efforts of President Ware to fight corruption? I think with, with the, with, there are efforts from the anti graph institutions like uh, the LACC, the GAC, but then they are now well-funded in order to support and fight 
fight to the depth of the society, that these institutions, the anti grant institutions, must they should be fully funded to fight corruption. For instance, there is someone or someone in legislature cannot be making fifty thousand plus. I'm assuming, and someone in anti grant institution be making something like five thousand for for crying out loud. And uh, he would take some a little of money to just to bury integrity in the, in the pocket of someone. So if corruption might be fought in Liberia, I think it come with integrity, it come with fairness as well, and with resources. So with, with the effort, I think is now well, and uh, that's the reasons why the government keep fighting the way to to minimize corrections to little bus. With this regime, I don't think that corrections will actually be minimized and they, they will feel level of effort. And I think it's very low. We cannot just minimize corruption at this moment. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. This is where we draw the anchor on today's uh, show. We wait to see if Senator Simakai uh, will take his place in the Liberian National Assembly. And of course, uh, this is a penultimate year to a general elections in Liberia, and we do know how important the issue of corruption is. Yeah. So we'll keep our eyes on the radar in Liberia. I'd like to thank uh, gentlemen, uh, Joel Cholo Brooks, uh, CEO of Global News Network in Monrovia, Liberia, and Hansen Gonsia Blayen, a uh, criminal justice uh, student at the University of Montserrado. Yes, we'll also, we'll also like to thank um, Kunle Lawal, a human rights lawyer. And of course, Inibeha F. Young, who joined us earlier also to discuss the issues of Nigeria's electoral amendment bill. And according to reports that we discussed earlier on the conversation, uh, there are reports from close sources of the presidency that on Friday, the president will finally grant his assent. So our fingers are crossed. We wait to see what's going to happen. And just like Liberia is also uh, going forward for elections, Nigeria's elections also next year, 2023, and a lot of things are wrapping up. And we do expect that all stakeholders do their best to make sure that there's a free and fair elections in Nigeria. This is where we'll draw the curtains for today's edition of The Conversation. I am Rita Omodia. Do join us same time on Friday. And I'm Benga Boroa. Catch you on Friday.